This is a mixed gathering, our elders and our youth. Many of our elders, they have reached the age, I'm sure they will have grandsons, granddaughters, and they are our youth who will have sons and daughters. Others, very young, our youth, children, they are very great blessing and ni'mat of Allah Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala mentions in the Quran Sharif that we made your pairs. Wallahu ja'ala lakum min anfusikum azwada. Wa ja'ala lakum min azwadikum banina wa hafad. And from your pairs, from your wives, we made sons and grandsons. Allah Ta'ala mentions this ni'mat of family life, husband and wife. It's a ni'mat in itself. And after that, Allah Ta'ala mentions the ni'mat of blessing children. Usually, we take this ni'mat of children for granted. Young boy, young girl, they are married. After one year, two years, usually there is a child in the house. We become happy. There is a boy in the house. There is a girl in the house. But we do not take it, it very seriously and we don't take it from that aspect. Those couples who are married for 10 years and 15 years, but they do not have children. Now you ask them, how much eager they are to acquire children, how much effort they make to acquire children, to what extent they go in treatment, in tawis, in dua, etc., to acquire a child. So those people who are married for 10, 15 years, and they don't have a child and children, they appreciate this name of child. After 10 years of married life, after 15 years of married life, when they are blessed with a child, we can see their happiness. <coughs> one is normal people, after one year, two years of marriage, there is a child in the house, there is happiness. But we can see the difference. So those people who do not have children, and they are longing for children, they are eager for children, and they are trying all they could to acquire a child. They, when they acquire a child, their happiness is of different kind from those people who usually after one or two years, they have a child. Regarding children, <coughs> once I went to South Hall, London, I was staying in a masjid. One person, middle age, he came to meet me. I was in a masjid. And he had one young boy with him. So we made dua salam. How are you? After that, he said to him, Mufti Sahib, there is an amazing story regarding this boy. He is my son. He said, me and my wife, we were married for 10 to 12, 15 years. We did not have any children. <coughs> Once, one Maulana Sahib, he came to our masjid, the South Hall Masjid. And he gave a bayan. And he gave bayan on the virtues and fazilat of Quran Sharif. Making our children hafiz, engaging our children in path of deen, allowing them to acquire knowledge of deen. So at the end of the bayan, the Maulana Sahib, he made a tashkil. That he said, like, who is prepared and who is willing, who makes intention that he will allow his child to become hafiz of Quran. So people sitting there, Many of them put their hands up. Now he said, regarding me, that I had no child, I had no children. So how can I put my hand up? I was in a, such a state. So after that, the Maulana Sahib said that those people who don't have children, who makes an intention that if Allah Ta'ala will bless me a child, I will make that child hafiz of Quran. So that person said, straight away, I put my hand up. <laughs> So he said, in that very year, Allah Ta'ala blessed me a son and this is that son. Allah. The intention of making the child hafiz of Quran, 
10, 15 years, we can imagine wow. how much he will have tried, how much dua he will have made, how much treatment he will have gone through. Nothing had worked. But when he made the intention of allowing his child, he was not even born. But when he made that intention, in that very year, Allah Ta'ala blessed him a child. At that time, he was about 11, 12 years of old. He said, now I'm trying to fulfill that promise I have made to Allah Ta'ala. And I have put him in half his class, make dua, Allah Ta'ala allowed him to complete his hips. So we can see our intention. Usually, regarding the children, <coughs> we have our, when a child is about to be born or is born, then the usual, our aspirations, our ambition, I will make my child a doctor. I will make my child an engineer. I will put my child in such a line. No, we are not owners of our children. The children, they are trust of Allah <coughs> in our hands. We are not usually for my son, my daughter. I will bring them up in whatever way I want to bring them up. I will put into whatever line I want to put them in. They're my property. That is a wrong conception. That is a wrong thought. We are not owners of our children. They are trust of Allah Ta'ala in our hands. The difference between ownership and trust. For example, we are owners of our car. We are owners of our house. If you want to sell our car, you want to change our car, we can do so. We can sell our car and whatever money we receive, we become owner of that money. It's halal for us. We can use that money for whatever possible, permissible matter we want to use it. We are owner of our house. If you want to sell our house, it is permissible. And whatever money we acquire, it is permissible to use that money. But if somebody is in need of cash, if somebody is in need of money, and he has five sons, is it permissible for him to sell one of his sons? Understand? Is it permissible? Yeah. And even if he sells whatever money he acquires, is that money halal for him? So if we were owners of our children, just as we are owners of our car, our house, then it would be permissible for us to sell our child. But mashallah, look, everybody is agreeing. Everybody knows the masla that it is not permissible to sell our son or daughter. Why? We, if we were owners, then it would be permissible. But as we agree that it is not permissible, why? We are not owners of our children. It's a property of Allah Ta'ala directly. So that is why. So when a person has this conception, my son, my daughter, I will bring it up in whatever I want to. That is a wrong conception. That is a wrong thought. No, it's a property of Allah Ta'ala. It's a trust of Allah Ta'ala in our hands. And we all know the masla regarding trust. Somebody is going on a journey. And he gives us any of his property for safekeeping. Somebody comes to us and he gives us a bundle of thousand pounds. He says, I'm going on a journey. Please look after this money. Or he brings a box of jewelry. And he gives to us that I'm going on a journey. Please look after this jewelry. When I'll come back, I'll take it from you. So every <coughs> sensible person knows that it is not for me to use that jewelry. My responsibility is to safeguard it. Not even open it. Keep it as it is. And when that person returns, return him back in the condition he had given to me. If we do that, then we have fulfilled the trust. And we have fulfilled our obligation. If not, I open the box, I take out the jewelry, start to wear it, start to allow my wife or daughter to wear that, that is khiyamat. Even though after using, I put it back in the box. But I have made khiyamat, I have betrayed the trust. And if it becomes lost, then I will have to pay the ziman and penalty of it. So exactly in the same way, the children, they are the property and trust of Allah Ta'ala in our hands. Allah Ta'ala gives us children in a pure state. Ma min illa yuladu al fitra. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, every newborn child, he's born with a pure nature. When the child is born, his heart is pure. His mind is pure. Allah Ta'ala wants that child back with a pure heart and pure mind and pure actions. So once the child is born, then it is our responsibility to safeguard that purity. The child is like an empty box, empty vessel, empty cup. All the, mashallah, there are many youth sitting here also. So for the elders, it's regarding their children, what I'm saying. And for the youth, it's co directly concerning them. That we, our body, we are not owners of our body. The young wife today says, oh, my life. I can use my life in whatever way I want. Just as a parent, they say, my son, my daughter. In the youth, he says, my life. I can use my life in whatever way I want to use it. If I want to watch TV, I will watch TV. If I want to go to cinema, I will go to cinema. If I want to go to club, I will go to club. If I want to make a friendship with a girl, I will make a friendship with a girl. My parents, they have no say in it. What do you think? Is their thinking right or wrong? Mm -hmm. No. The misconception has come that he has taken himself to be the owner of himself. If he realizes that I am not owner of myself, I am a trust of Allah, just that the parents are responsible over the children. We ourselves are responsible over ourselves in looking after ourselves. Ya ayyuhalladina amanu alaykum anfusakum. Oh believers, get control over yourselves. If we are owners of our own selves, then there would be no need for this command. In how many places Allah Ta'ala mentions Whosoever fears to stand in front of Allah Ta'ala on day of Qayyamat, that on day of Qayyamat, I will have to stand in front of Allah Ta'ala. There are many, many lowly desires in our heart. From worldly aspect. But a sensible person, he does not go out and carry them out. Somebody goes to a shop, he hasn't got money in his pocket. Or somebody goes to a petrol pump. He hasn't got money in his pocket. And he's tempted to fill the tank without giving money. 30 pounds of tank. But straight away the thought comes. If I'm caught, I will be put in front of the police station. So the thought of standing in front of the police inspector, that stops him from filling the tank without giving money. Exactly in the same way here. That if a person realizes that, that tomorrow... I will have to stand in front of Allah. Who fears to stand in front of Allah when Allah will question me. How did you pass your life? What did you do with your youth? How did you utilize your youth? So that will make him concerned. That will make him worried. That will make him fearful. And the effect of that standing in front of Allah Ta'ala, the practical effect, he controls his lowly desires. There are many, many people, especially when they start to come towards the deen, they start and complain, oh, my nafs, it does not allow me to perform salat. My nafs, it does not allow me to keep my gaze down. My nafs, it does not allow me to stay away from the TV. My nafs is urging me to sit in front of TV. My nafs, uh, so... That is our test. That on one side, the nafs is calling me, attract me, attracting me towards evil. Now, our test is in controlling that nafs. People complain, for example, that I have a lot of anger in me. So anger is in the heart. The youth, they complain, I have a lot of lowly desires in my heart. Shehwa. I can't control my eyes. I can't control my ears. I can't control my heart. So desires in the heart, that is not in our control. I have anger in my heart. So we should not be worried about what is in the heart. Because if we did not have these desires, if we do not have these passions within us, then we would be like angels. Angels are such, they're made in such a way 
that they don't have any passion and any desire. So we are human beings. <coughs> and we have been set on this earth for test. So on one side, there are so many desires in our heart, depending on our condition, to watch TV, etc. So our test is to control our nafs. nafsa anil hawa. Allah Ta'ala says that he controls his lowly desires. If there were no desires, what is there to control? al mean al In another place, Allah Ta'ala says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةِ الْأَوْضُ وَالسَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ أُعِدَّ بِالْمُتَّقِينَ أَلَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاعِ وَالضَّرَّاعِ وَحِينَ الْبَقْسِ أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ أُولَٰئِكَ فِي السَّرَّاعِ وَالضَّرَّاعِ وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْثِ Those people who control their gaze, those people who control their anger, if there was no anger in the heart, what was there to control? So usually people become confused. In this matter, oh, I have a lot of anger in me. My anger does not go. I have a lot of shepherd in me. My shepherd does not go. I have a lot of hiss in me. It does not go. No, we should not be worried about the anger in the heart. We should not be worried about the shepherd in the heart. We should not be worried about the greed in the heart. That is there. Our test is to not act according to that anger. Our test is to not act according to that desire in the heart. Our test is not to act according to that greed. For example, early point, a person wants to become a wealthy person. So for that, he makes a plan. I will open a business and through the business, I will acquire wealth. Now but he hasn't got enough money himself to start a business. So now it comes in his mind, take a loan from the bank. So now, to take a loan from the bank, naturally, it's a de dealing in interest. So one is an open greed. You make, you <coughs> ask somebody, please will you give me this? Anything, any type of acquiring of wealth, which is against the command of Sharia, that is a sign of greed. When we ask somebody, please will you give me 10 pounds? Will you give me some food? Then everybody says, oh, he's a greedy person. Hmm? Small children, somebody's eating crisp. The another says, will you give me some crisp? Straight away, what will you feel? He's greedy. Somebody having a drink, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, whatever. So one of his friends says, come and give us some. So people around him, straight away, what thought will come in our mind? Hmm? He's a greedy person. But that elderly person who goes to the bank and he's taking 100,000 on loan, and he's breaking the command of Allah Ta'ala. He's taking on interest. Oh. Nobody tells him a greedy person. But in fact, inside of Allah Ta'ala, inside of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what is he? He's a greedy person. And his greed is greater than that person who asked for a bit of crisp. His greed is greater than that person who asked for a sip of drink. Why? Because he's asking, it's a greed, but it's not a guna. If that other person gives him willingly, then it's permissible for him. But that person who went to the bank and they gave him 100,000, but because in acquiring that wealth, he has broken the command of Allah Ta'ala, his greed is greater. So nevertheless, that usually we look at our, oh, my heart does not allow me to wake up for the Salat. So that is our test. The heart says, oh, the further is 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock is very early. Hmm? You went to sleep 12 o'clock. So the nafs will say that. So because th that is not the matter to worry. The matter to worry and concern is do I wake up or not? So if the heart does not allow me, the nafs does not allow me, but I force myself and I wake up, I come to the masjid, I perform my salat, I have passed my test. So this applies in every aspect of life. We go out, on the footpath, in the street, in the town, there is a design in the heart. Look at her, look at her, look at her. <laughs> so now any person has concern, oh, why this thought comes into me? Right? If this thought did not come, we would be angels. We are human beings. It's a natural attraction. If there was no attraction, then there was no need for Allah Ta'ala to command us. When does a person need to be commanded? 
when there is that attraction there, he needs to be checked. So, so one should here again there is an attraction in the heart. So one should not be usually. Now he looks at her and he he becomes worried. Oh, why did that thought come into me? Why did this desire come into me? Rather than becoming concerned about the desire coming in the heart, he should have been concerned at keeping control over his eyes. So we are responsible for our intentional acts. We are responsible for our intentional practices. So nevertheless, that regarding this matter, many, many people, like Vasavis, usually if a person is completely away from Deen, he doesn't have any Vasavis at all. Why? He's so much engrossed in his world. From the time he wakes up, up he goes to night, he has so many plans. I have to go there. I have to do this business, I have to deal with this. So it's so much engrossed, there is no thought of Salat in his life, there is no thought of Quran Sharif in his life. So the Shaitan does not need to put any service in it. He's already on the path of Shaitan. He's already pleasing the Shaitan in his all 24 hours life. So Shaitan does not need to touch him. Shaitan is content with him. Shaitan is satisfied with him. But now once that person starts to come towards the deen, he went in Jamaat, he went to Madrasa, he attached to the Buzu. So now the concern of deen starts to come into that person. Firstly, all 24 hours were revolving around the world, the desires and sins. So he was in the trap of Shaitan. Shaitan did not need to do anything with him because he was doing what Shaitan wanted from him. But now when he starts to move away from that life, and to the extent he comes towards the deen. Now shaitan becomes concerned. Oh, he's going out of my grip. He's going out of my net. Now he started to perform salat. So now shaitan wants to stop from salat. So now when he realizes I can't stop him directly. Because now he has acquired in one way or the other the concern of deen. So if I put him hard, don't perform salat. He will not listen to me. Because he has acquired this concern. So... Now he starts to play his tricks. Now he starts to put wasavis in his mind. Usually the first waswasa, bad thought which comes in mind, oh, hmm, your wuzu is not right. You went for urination, and after completing your urination, after making wuzu, a drop had come out. <laughs> Understand? So now when that told them, so after making wuzu, the drop has come out, is the wuzu valid or not valid? <laughs> hmm? So the wuzu is not valid. So when the wuzu is not valid, the salat you perform with that wuzu, is that valid or not? So the salat is not valid. So now shaitan tries to capture him in this way. So when you're not pure and your salat is not valid, what's the point in performing the salat? So now this is how the shaitan starts to cast that person. Or, for example, depending on that, like a shaitan, he's like a tabib. Our, the the, the Tabib, Hakim. The Hakim, they put their hands on the vein. And from there, they recognize the illness of the person. The Shaitan is a very experienced, he's very old. He recognizes our nature. He recognizes our instincts. So he recognized that through what way I can capture him, what way I can deceive him. So depending on our conditions. So nevertheless, to some people, he tricks them in this masla or paki and napaki. Sometimes, if you realize that this person, he's not too much concerned about paki and napaki, he puts him vaswasa of riya. Before he was so much engrossed because he never came near salat. So he never worried about urination. He never worried about drops coming out because he didn't have to perform salat. So that thought never occurred. Now he becomes worried, concerned. That before I never had these thoughts. Now, when I've started to perform Salat, now these thoughts had started to occur to me. So before, because Shaitan, he was on the path of Shaitan, he did not have to touch him, he didn't have to do anything. So these are three. In the same way, for example, some, with him he plays that he performs Salat. Now somebody passed by. And this person was performing Salat or reciting Quran, or making Zikr, a sort of a happiness comes in his heart that somebody has seen him. He becomes what he becomes, oh, this is real. This is showing off. Hmm? This person passed, and because of he showed you performing salat and reciting Quran, making zikr, you became happy. 
oh, you're not performing salat for sake of Allah Ta'ala. You're not reciting Quran for sake of Allah Ta'ala. So what's the point of such a salat? So this is how shaitan tricks a person. So nevertheless, you don't know where I started and where I went off. So regarding that the point I was mentioning regarding the children. That we are not owners of our children. That applies to the elders who are who have children or grandchildren. And the youth who are sitting here, to them, we are not owners of ourselves. This is a very common word, especially in the society we live in. The non-Muslims, they take their life to be. You, you are owner of your own self. You live your own life. You enjoy the life to the full. We should not be tricked and deceived by the way of life. Allah Ta'ala says, La yagurrannaka taqallubu alladheena kafaru fil bilad mata'un qaleel thumma ma'wahum jahannam wa bi salmiha. La yagurrannaka. Allah Ta'ala is addressing directly Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Do not be deceived. La yagurrannaka taqallubu alladheena kafaru bil milad. Those non-believers moving around in the cities. From one city to another, from one country to another, they have air flight tickets in their pocket for here and there. Allah Ta'ala says, do not be tricked. And this is what is happening with us. We are looking at them and we are trying to equal them or surpass them. No, their life is different. Our life is different. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Ad-dunya sijnul mu'min wa jannatul kafir. This world is a prison of a believer. And it's a paradise of a non-believer. Meaning, they have no share in the hereafter. They are free to do whatever they want to do in this world. Because they have no share. For a believer, it's a prison. What is a prison? A person loses his freedom. A person, he loses his free will. Free will. Once a person, he has been given an order to be in the prison, he realized from the very first day, that you won't have your way. He demands, my food should be such, my clothes should be such, my room should be such, my furniture in the jail will be such. Will he be given all these things? No, he's under complete control of other people. Whatever food he served, he will have to eat that. Whatever clothes he's given, he will have to wear those. Whatever room he has been given, he has to satisfy himself. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, this world is a prison of a believer. So that person is going into prison, if he makes up his mind from the beginning, I'm going in a prison. Whatever trouble, <coughs> difficulty he will have to face, he will have to face. But if he consoles himself with that, he will not become pareshan. The food is not to his liking. The clothes is not according to his liking. The room is not according to li his liking. He will find it difficult. But if he has consoled himself, if he has made himself understood, why it's a prison. So he will not become pareshan in the heart. But he's in a prison, but he wants the life as he has it at home. And starts to make tantrum. He starts to make demands. Will those tantrum and demand be fulfilled? He's in trouble. With that now, he will become pareshan also. So exactly same here. We live in this world. And Allah has blessed us more than what we need. But still, if we look at our heart, it's always in a state of anxiety. <coughs> the reason for that, what we have, we overlook it. What we don't have, we look at that and we make ourselves gloomy. I have food to eat. But I look at the food which is beyond that. I have clothes to wear. I have car to drive. But my next door neighbor, he has a better car than me. So rather than looking at the car which, have, which is sufficient for my need, I look at my neighbor's car which is more luxurious than mine, I make some, oh, I haven't got a car like my neighbor. So even having a name out of Allah Ta'ala, rather than being appreciative, rather than being thankful and grateful to Allah Ta'ala, that name which would have made him grateful to Allah Ta'ala, he's looking down on that name, he's overlooking that name, and he's looking at the next person, and he's making himself gloomy himself, and rather than grateful to Allah Ta'ala, he's, he's being ungrateful to Allah Ta'ala. So this is the reason usually we wake up in the morning and if you look at our state, do we wake up happily or do we wake up in a state of gloom? 
generally, if you look at ourselves, why? The ni'mas which are upon us, we overlook them. We take them for granted. And what we don't have, our mind goes, goes towards those things. And looking at those things, I don't have this, I don't have this, I don't have this. So that makes us gloomy, that makes us sad, that makes us sorrowful. So rather than being grateful to Allah Ta'ala, even having all these ni'mas, the person, he becomes ungrateful to Allah Ta'ala. So this is one of the reasons for being ungrateful to Allah Ta'ala. Okay, and that's the point I was mentioning regarding the children. My theme of the bayan is regarding our children. They are very precious property of Allah Ta'ala. And we are responsible, the elders, regarding the upbringing. And the youth themselves, they are responsible over themselves. Tomorrow, we will be questioned regarding our children and we ourselves also regarding as we have we passed our life. Allah has created many creatures in this world. Among them, the animals. Among them, the human beings. But human beings, they divide into two categories. Muslims and non-Muslims. We all know the life of animals, whether sheep, cows, goats. What is their way of life? They stay in the fields. <coughs> Soon as the dawn breaks, <coughs> it becomes light. What do the animals do? The youth, what do the animals do? You don't know. Please. Have you never seen the sheep and cows in the fields? Soon as the light comes out, what do we see the cows and sheep doing? Grazing. Grazing, eating the grass. And they will have the head down, they will walk, and they will keep eating, 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 eating. Now, when the stomach is filled, they will sit down, and that food is digested, they rest for a while, now they get up again, and what will they do? Hmm? They will start eating again, <coughs> up till night time. When it becomes night time, whatever shade they will find, they will go there, <coughs> they will pass the night there. And then the next day will start and the routine will start again. So that is an animal life. <coughs> eating, 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 resting, sleeping at night time, wake up again. and then. So if the animal is not utilized, if it's a cow, the owner does not milk it, then it will pass its life like that. If it's a sheep, if it's a goat, if the owner does not bring it into use, then it will pass its life like that. So that is a life of an animal. Allah So that is one. They are also creatures. They are animals. We are also animals. But Allah Ta'ala has made us one stage higher than them. وَلَقَدْ كَلَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ وَحَمَلْنَاهُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُ مِنْ الطَّيِّبَةِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُ عَلَىٰ كَثِيرٍ مِمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا Otherwise, we are animals. Everything which is in animal is in us also. Outwardly features, we have eyes, animals have eyes. We have mouth, they have mouth, ears, hands and feet. So from that aspect, we are similar to animals. But Allah has blessed them, blessed us something special over the animals. So nevertheless, that is one aspect. Animals, they have their way of life, which is in simple words, eat, rest and sleep. So that is the routine of their life. Now we come to human beings. As I mentioned, in humans there are two categories. Believers, mu'min, Muslim, and a non-believer. Non-believer, he has his way of life. A non-believing youth. What time does he wake up in the morning? Someone, I'm asking the youth. We leave the elders. Hmm? What time does the non-believing youth wake up? Eight o'clock? to go to his school, to go to his college. So he'll wake up eight o'clock. He will relieve himself. He will shave his beard if he's 16 over. He will take a shower probably. He will dress himself. He will sit on a table and chair, take his breakfast. Then he will set off for his school. He will set off for his college. He will attend his class two, three hours. Then 12 o'clock, one o'clock, he will go to a nearby cafe. He will buy some sandwich or burger, whatever. He will eat that. He will have his drink. Then he will attend school again, two, three hours, college. Then four o'clock, he'll be back at home. 
he will take his tea. Then depending on the season, most uh, weather, he might go to out to play football. He might go out to play cricket, tennis, gym, whatever. He will come back home, 8 o'clock. Then he will take his supper, sit in front of the TV for one or two hours, and probably 10 o'clock, he will go to sleep. That's a general picture of a non-Muslim. Right? So that is a life of a non-Muslim youth. Alhamdulillah, I am a Muslim. Allah has given me a birth in a Muslim family. Now I look at my life. What time do I wake up? I wake up 8 o'clock. And then I follow the routine of a non-Muslim boy. I take a shower. I take my breakfast on the table and chair. I go to school 3-4 hours. Then same as that non-believer. So a non-Muslim and a Muslim boy. If my life is us, the life of that non-Muslim boy, I say I'm a Muslim. Practically, what is the difference between my life and a non-Muslim life? So this is where we are sleeping away. Our youth, whether we go to school, whether we go to college, whether we go for work. No, we have been guided in every aspect of life. <coughs> Their way of life is different. In how many places Allah Ta'ala warns us? Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu in tuti'u fariqam min alladheena utul kitab yaruddukum ba'da imanikum kafirin. O believers, if you will follow any of the group of the Ahle Kitab, the Jews and the Christians, yaruddukum ba'da imanikum kafirin, they will turn you back from your iman towards kufr. So this is a practical. We are following, as I mentioned, so to whatever extent. Now, being a Muslim, what is a, the essence of a Muslim life is the remembrance of Allah Ta'ala, the obedience of Allah Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala mentions the purpose of the creation of all the ins and jinn, not the Muslim. I have not created the jinnat, I have not created the insan, but that they may worship me for the worship of Allah Ta'ala. What is worship? Glorifying Allah Ta'ala through our actions. Glorifying Allah Ta'ala through our tongue. Glorifying Allah Ta'ala through our heart. So that is the purpose of our life. We need to eat. We need to dress. We need to sleep. We need to get married. These are necessities of the life. That they are not the purpose of life. Simple example. We have a car. A young people. Somebody asks, what's the purpose of car? What answer will you give? <coughs> what's the, hmm, your father or you, you passed your test? You bought a car. Somebody, why, why you bought a car? What will we say? Come on. Huh? Drive. Hmm? And go to your duties, fulfill your duties. So that's the purpose of the car. Now somebody, he's got a car and he checks the petrol, he checks the oil, he puts the water, he washes the car every week. But he does not drive it. Every day he brings out the car and he does all the polishing, he does all the watering, he does all the oiling. But after that he puts it back in the garage. What will we say regarding that person? He's not using the car. Will you not say he's a stupid? He's a fool? Why? He's not using that car for the purpose. You need to put the petrol. You need to put the oil. You need to put the water. You need to clean it. You need to check the tires. But all that, they are the necessities. They are not purpose of that car. The purpose of the car is to drive. The purpose of the car is to, through that car, you fulfill your needs. You go to work. You go to see your relatives. You go for shopping. So if the car is not used for the purpose it has been made and this person he keeps polishing it and watering it etc. What will you say regarding that person? <laughs> Understand? Exactly in the same way. I fill my body with food. I fill my body with water and drink. I clothe myself. I adorn myself. I'm doing everything. But the purpose of this body is not taken from the body. What will we say regarding that person? Will you not say he's a stupid? He's a fool? Is that happening with 
I said, we uh, generally I'm speaking, not saying, mashallah, people start, uh, sitting here, but this is a general, that the, regarding everything, a house, the purpose of a house is to live in. So somebody, he has two houses, he lives in one, the other is completely empty, mm. but every year he takes down the wallpaper and decorates the house. Mm. He paints the house from inside, outside, and he does everything, but nobody lives in that house. And every year, he does that. What will you say regarding that? <coughs> so exactly same regarding our body. That the purpose of ourselves, the purpose of our body is the worship of Allah. <coughs> if we eat, if we drink, if we sleep, if we wear clothes, everything. That these are the necessities of life. They are not the purpose of life. When this purpose goes out of a person's mind, then what is not a purpose of life, the person makes the purpose that. Nowadays we see mm. eating. The eating in itself is not a purpose of life. It's just like putting petrol in the tank of the car. <laughs> that is not the purpose. You need to put the petrol so the car will run. But the car is not used and every one week he fills the tank. Where will that oil petrol go to? It will spill out. So exactly same with ourselves. So nowadays, regarding all these things, that since we have lost the purpose of life, Quran Sharif guides us. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam guides us. Then we might look at the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam regarding the worldly aspect of life. How simple Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam observed. We know the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What was the eating habit of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? What was the drinking habit of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? What was the dressing, house, everything Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Why did Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam kept these things to the simplest possible level? Why? Because we have one body, we have one time, we have one mind, we have one heart. So you cannot utilize this one body for two different aspects. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, man ahabba dunyahu adarra bi akhiratihi. وَمَنْ أَحَبَّ آخِرَتَهُ أَذَرَّ بِدُنْيَاهُ Whoso, مَنْ أَحَبَّ دُنْيَاهُ Whosoever will love his world, he will harm his hereafter. And whosoever will love his hereafter, then he will harm his world. Meaning you can't have best of the both. This is what we are trying. That my world should be the best as possible. And my being and hereafter, this is for those who have concern. And those people who don't have any concern, they are only one-sided towards the world. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa informed us and guided us that you can't have the best of the both. Why? We don't have two bodies. We don't have two minds. We don't have uh, two different sets of uh, organs, limbs. It's the same one body. It's the same one time. Either you occupy, use it for deen or you use it for the dunya. Very simple example. One student, he goes to madrasa. He becomes Hafiz, he becomes Ali. So that same body, the same time is required for that. Now, with that, he wants to become a top Ali and he wants to become a top educated person. Is that possible? No. In the same way, a student, he goes to college. Two, two level equal two people. One, he went to the madrasa. The other, he went to school, he went to college. He took one path. He took one part. So this person who's gone to madrasa, who's gone to, uh, and he's become half, he's become an alim because he has used and occupied his ability towards the deen. He cannot attend and he cannot utilize him for the world. In the same way, that person who occupied himself in going to school, college, university, he's occupied with that. He's using his ability. He's using his time for that. So he will not be able to uh, uh, apply himself with the deen. You cannot have best of the both. You have to choose between the one. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa made the decision for us. Man ahabba dunyahu adarra bi akhirati. Wa man ahabba akhiratu adarra bi dunya. You cannot have best of the both. You have to choose one of the two. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa decided for us. Choose that which is forever over that which is going to perish. 
A student, a young boy, he starts his education, whether it's a dini education or worldly education, at the age of five, normally. And then the progress until the age of, say, 25. This person who goes to school, he will go to primary, he will go to school, high school, he will go to college, he will go to university. And at the age of, say, around 25, he will graduate. He might become doctor, engineer, solicitor, if he passes through all the stages. So all the time he has occupied, he has acquired some ability of the world, some qualification of that world. He has become doctor, he will acquire the benefits of becoming a doctor. If he has become an engineer, he will acquire the benefit of becoming an engineer. He will have a high salary. Through that high salary, he will have a good house, he will have a good car, he will have a good name in the society. But how long will that last? As long as he is alive. Age of 60, 70, soon as he passes away, his salary, whatever is accumulated, will stay here. The house which he has acquired will stay here. The car he has acquired he has stayed here. So he made effort for 25 years. And the result of that 25 years is said next, how many? 35 years? 25, 30, and so we, 70. So that is 45 years. So he made effort for 25 years. For how long? 45 years, which is going to stay in this world. After that 45 years, his doctorate, his engineering, whatever the ability of <laughs> the world, it will be of no use in the hereafter. Another person, okay, he's five years, he doesn't have any choice, but his parents. His parents, they put him on the line of deen. He went to madrasa, he became hafiz, he became alim, he became whatever, and he became deen da. And he completes his studies and qualifications, we say, at the age of 25. He's become an alim, he's become a deen da. So naturally, in deen, there is not a great salary. So he will not acquire the benefits of the world through the qualification he has acquired. He will live in a simple house. He will have simple clothes. His life will be simple. But whatever qualification he has acquired, he applied himself according to that. He practiced according to knowledge he acquired. He propagated that knowledge. He made khidmat of deen. And he passed away at the age of 60 and 70. Who do you think is better off? <laughs> hmm? Have you understood what I'm saying or not? <laughs> Out of these two people, one who became a doctor, engineer, and he accumulated all the world. <coughs> and he passed away at the age of 70. And this person, whose his parents put through the line of deen, and age of 25, he qualified, he became an alim, and he had a simple life. Everything was simple because he didn't have so much that he can have an extravagant life. He also passed away at the age of 70. Now, you can compare between the two. Who will you say successful? Ali. Ali. Huh? Ali. I want the youth to speak. They seem to stay quiet. I don't, they don't understand what I'm saying. Because martial elders are elders. It's for the youth to understand something. I'm sure the youth who goes to school, college, they will fill their minds and heart. Your future, your future, your future. Hmm? If you do your coursework, mm. if you have good grades in your DCSE, if you have good grades in your A-levels, and if then your future will be bright. So you can see the brightness of that future. How long? Usually we find that student, even there before they reach that stage, they tumble away. They start to wrong, pick up wrong habits. They're still at school and they start to smoke. They go to college, they make wrong friendship. So if that usually we find that they don't reach that stage of becoming a doctor, engineer, what ambitions they had, what ambitions their parents had. Usually before that time, so many distractions occur that they tumble out even before that time. But shall we imagine that they reach that stage, but even then at the end. So one should not be deceived by the society we live in. Their way of life is different because they have no future to look towards. For them, there is only in in here illa hayatuna dunya namutu wa nahya wa ma nahlu bi mabuthin. Allah mentions their belief. In here illa hayatuna dunya. There is no other life than this worldly life. Namutu wa nahya. 
we die in this world, we become alive in this world. We are not going to go to life again. So that is their belief. And naturally when their belief is everything is this world. So they will put all their effort towards making this world. We are, being, we are Muslims. It is our belief that this is not the end of the life. This is not all of the life. The world in itself is not the purpose. No, it's a preparation for the hereafter. What am I preparing? How am I preparing? Ad-dunya mazra atul akhir. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, this world is a preparation for the hereafter. And there are two places in the hereafter. Jannah and Jahannam. Whatever way we will prepare here, then we will face the place of the hereafter. Kullu nafsin da'ikatul maut wa inna ma tuwaffawna ujurakum yawm al-qiyam fa man zuhziya lin-nar wa udkhila al-jannah faqad faz wa ma al-hayatu dunya illa mata'u al-ghurur Allah Ta'ala warns us the scale and criteria of success and failure Allah Ta'ala mentions in the Quran fa man zuhziya lin-nar that person who has been kept away from jahannam wa udkhila al-jannah and who has been entered into jannah faqad faz he has become <coughs> successful our worldly criteria, he became a doctor, he's successful. He became an engineer, he's successful. He became a counselor, he's successful. He became a president he be of a local community, he's successful. No, these are not scales of success. The scale of success, the criteria of success, Allah Ta'ala mentioned Holy Quran. And that depends on our acts and actions, our way of life. So youth, we look into our life. As I mentioned, it does not occur into our mind that one day we will have to stand in front of Allah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa mentions the criteria of a sensible person, a foolish person. <coughs> sensible person, intelligent person is that person who controls his nafs, who takes accounts of his nafs. Where is my nafs taking me? What is my nafs demanding from me? And am I fulfilling whatever demand of my heart? Now there's you says, nobody can stop me. If I'm to go to cinema, my father can't stop me. My mother can't stop me. My dad cannot stop me. I'm independent. I'm free. This is what he thinks. No, he's not free. He's completely subdued by his nafs and shaitan. The nafs and shaitan are showing the ways. He's following their ideas. He's following their guidance. But because they're invisible, he cannot see the nafs. He cannot see the shaitan. They only put the thought in the person's mind and he follows that and he thinks, I am independent, I'm free. No, he is caged by nafs and shaitan. If he will not realize that, today the desires of nafs for a youth, they will come out in the form of the desires of a youth. The very same nafs when it will become middle age, then it will transform into their uh, shape. When a person, he becomes middle-aged, then the desires he had of younger days, going to cafe, restaurant, cinema, club, when he reaches the age of 40, 45, he's not interested in these things. He's past those days. Now, at the age of 45, his interests are different. He wants to acqu accumulate wealth. He wants a big house. He wants a house with a garden front and back. He wants a big car. So, the nurse was playing with that youth in different ways when he was young. The very same nafs is playing with this middle-aged person in a different way. The very same person, when he reaches the age of 60 and 70, he's acquired wealth, he's acquired big house, now he's not too much interested. In now he wants a position in the society. He wants to become a president of the masjid. He wants to become a secretary of the committee. Why? It's prestige. It's a honor in people's eyes. So, the, in that youth, the nafs was playing with that youth in his form. That very same nafs, it was playing in that middle-aged person according to his condition. Now the very same nafs is playing with that elderly person in a different form, all along the line. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu alaykum anfusan wa amma man khafa maqama rabbihi wa nahan nafsan Whether we are young, whether we are middle-aged, whether we are elderly, in whatever condition. So now I'll finish the bayan. I had started regarding the children, but the topic moved away from one place to another. So the theme of the bayan is we should not be tricked by the world we live in.
especially the society we live in, is of different people. They have no imagination of the hereafter. Their life is this world. Their paradise is this world. And what is paradise? Place of enjoyment. No barriers. What is Jannah? Jannah is a place where you fulfill your desires. Hmm? Allah Ta'ala says, whatever you will desire, whatever you will ask for. So that is Jannah. Now this, this is what the non-believers try to do in this world. What is TV? What is video? What is internet? What is cinema? What is club? What is cafe? What is gym? Are they not means of fulfilling desires? So they create these things, they enjoy themselves. But being a Muslim, I also get tricked. I also have TV in my house. I also have video in my house. I also have internet and obscene matters in my house. I also go to club. I also go to restaurant. So he is a non-Muslim. His paradise is world. I'm a Muslim. It's a prison for me. I'm trying to turn the prison into paradise. If I make my paradise in this world, and in that I break the commands of Allah Ta'ala, I displease Allah Ta'ala, what will happen to my paradise of the hereafter? Will I enter into that paradise or will I enter into the prison of the hereafter? So, the one, especially the youth, is for me and everybody. So, our purpose of life is to be obedient to Allah Ta'ala. We eat, we drink, we live in the house. That is not the purpose of life. There are the necessities of the life to sustain our body and through that body, we carry out the commands of Allah Ta'ala. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu kulu minat wa wa'amadu swaliha. Allah Ta'ala mentions eating first. Oh believers, eat halal. Wa'amadu swaliha. And whatever energy you acquire, Whatever strength you acquire in your body from that food, wa'amalu swaliha. Be obedient to Allah Ta'ala. Before we'll drive the car, what we'll have to do? We'll drive the car empty, empty tank. We bought a new car. The first thing we'll do, what will we do? Put in the petrol. In the same way, Allah Ta'ala, look, same philosophy is here. We need to fill this tank with food and drink. But don't just suffice on filling the tank. No, once the tank is filled, the strength in the body, now utilize that strength for the purpose of which we have been created. If we do that, then that eating is of benefit. That drink is of benefit. It will also count into sawab. It will also count into deen. But that very same food, the drink, the clothes, the house, everything, we acquire these things, but the purpose is not there. The obedience of Allah is not there. Instead, it's a disobedience. <coughs> then you can imagine that person, he is bagawat. He is a betrayer and he is a rebellion. And he is a <coughs> rebel to Allah. So hopefully, what I have said, it will open my mind and your mind also. It will clear our mind. So we realize the purpose of our life. And we make our it's not but at least the first thing nowadays many of you the parents say, Oh, perform salat, oh, recite Quran Sharif. He doesn't know what's the purpose of life. Why namaz? Hmm? Why Quran Sharif? So if he does not understand the purpose of life, then the parents say, Why are they nagging at me? Hmm? It's my life. So no. So hopefully that the youth also have realized. That the purpose of our life is not to please ourselves. In this world, we please Allah Ta'ala by His obedience. Allah Ta'ala has provided us with everything. The purpose of this provision, just like the car, the oil, the water, the petrol, so that the car is in good condition and we use that car for driving and fulfilling our needs. Exactly in the same way, Allah yeah. has provided us with food, drink and all our necessities. So it's not for the sake of itself. No, the purpose behind that, having all these amenities, having all these names of Allah Ta'ala, we use ourselves for the purpose for which we have been created, the obedience of Allah Ta'ala. If we do so, we are fulfilling our purpose. And inshallah Ta'ala, we will have a sukoon and we will have a peaceful life in this world. And Allah Ta'ala will bless us, Jannah to his pleasure in the year. Amen. And if you are tricked and deceived by this world, and we just paint the picture of the success of this world, 
then we are tricked, deceived, and there is a dangerous standing in front of us. May Allah Ta'ala save us from such a condition. Amen. So I will just make a short uh, tashkeel, especially our youth, that who makes an intention that inshallah ta'ala, I will not follow my lowly desires. As I've said, we don't have to worry about the desires coming in the heart. That is not to worry about. Our concern and our responsibility is not to follow the lowly desire. So who makes an intention now? Put your hand up. Alhamdulillah. So it's a very simple principle. Hmm? Actually, Isha Salat, half past 10, quarter to 11. Hmm? So, oh, it's very late. I have to go to school. Hmm? For the Salat, half past five, what does our youth say? Oh, it's very early. I have to go to school. Hmm? Have you been created to go to school or have you been created to perform the Ishan for the Salat? <laughs> Understand? So we should put the Sharia, the deen in front of us. Whatever is the command of Allah, Tala, whether we like it or not, we force out. That is called Mujahada. <laughs> mujahada means to struggle against one nafs in carrying out the command of Allah. Tala. وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادٍ وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا So that is the meaning of mujahada. Mujahada does not mean you stay hungry. Mujahada does not mean it's cold and you don't wear any clothes. That is not mujahada. The reality of mujahada is the nafs is not prepared. We force our nafs in carrying out the command of Allah Ta'ala. The nafs is calling me towards evil. The nafs is calling me towards sin. To control that nafs. To fight against the nafs and not allow the nafs to carry out that evil that person has won in his battle against the nafs and shaitan. May Allah Ta'ala bless us the, the value of the deen Allah Ta'ala has given to us. Amen. Give us uh, uh, and give us tawfiq to make our life such. So, Abdul Alim Sahib said in his introduction that our life should be such that whenever the call of death comes, we are eager and prepared for it. At that time, we do not have to become afraid. We do not have to become hesitant and fear. Oh, I'm not prepared. Please give me one day. Please give me one hour. And a person's time comes, not a single moment is brought forward or taken back. May Allah Ta'ala give us the tawfiq to make our life such that we are prepared and every moment we pass, that is our benefit in the hereafter and not our loss in the hereafter. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وآله وأصحابه أجمعين